Um, one more time, see if I can get that to show up. For some reason, it didn't. Okay. Um, well, good thing I tried it before we depended on it. Anyway, <laughs> uh, very excited to have Julie Starling here. She uh, is the, um, let's see, Agile Delivery Practice Manager, quite a name for a, um, let's see, you said it was a building society, which I think for people in the U.S. is more like what, kind of like what we would call a credit union. So a banking establishment that's owned by the, the members. Anyway, she's going to be talking to us about using data to ignite meaningful action. So, Julie, I will turn this over to you. And thank you for so much for coming and presenting to us today. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you so much for everyone uh, being here. So I'm just going to share today my experiences and what we're doing next. So I'm not claiming these are the answers. They are some answers that hopefully you might find useful. I'll apologize in advance for saying data is data and not data. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a habit <laughs> I'm uh, not into yet. So uh, please forgive me. Um, so yeah, what I want to talk about today is that we are all consuming data when we're delivering software, but are we using that data to take meaningful action? So when we think about um, software delivery, I like to think about there being two types of data. So you've got data that allows you to, to take meaningful action for customers and for teams. And then you have data that gives you the illusion of being able to do that. So maybe a couple of thumbs up here if anyone has seen the matrix. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'm not on my own here. Um, so for anyone who hasn't, yeah, a few thumbs up there, that's great. Hopefully for anyone who hasn't, so the main character, Neo, he gets a choice of a blue pill or a red pill. So if he takes the blue pill, he gets to return to his life, he gets to believe whatever he wants, and it's the choice of putting his head in the sand and being ignorant to what's really going on. But if he takes the red pill, he faces an uncertain future, but he gets to know the truth about what's really going on. So he gets to learn this uncomfortable truth, but he also gets the opportunity to take some action and influence the future. And I believe we have this same choice with data. So we can take a blue pill, we can keep planning, we can keep estimating and work into deadlines that are unachievable, and we can believe the illusion of the estimated date. Or we can take the red pill and we can use data that represents the truth that software delivery is uncertain, so we can't possibly know the outcomes on day one. So if you stay with me, I'm going to spend the next probably 35, 40 minutes running through how we've been able to change the narrative with our teams and our stakeholders and how we now um, ignite action and stop using data that gives the illusion of certainty. So. As Mark kindly introduced me, my name is Julie Starling. I am the Agile Delivery Practice Manager at Principality Building Society. So yes, a bank-like institution, but we're owned by our members who are our customers. So we're really customer focused and everything we do, we have them at the center of our decisions rather than stakeholders, which is really nice and sort of gives us a lovely culture. Um, anyone in the audience who's a rugby fan might recognize the name because we sponsored the stadium in Cardiff, so the Principality Stadium, that's us sponsoring the stadium. The building society is around 160 years old, so we have about 1,200 people in total that work for Principality across our head office and our branch network. From a delivery perspective, we're made up of three value streams, um, which is a total of 12 delivery teams. So we have some Scrum, some Scrum with Kanban, a couple of Kanban, and we also have a platforms and engineering team, infrastructure and EAS as well. So as uh, I said, I'm the practice manager for Agile Delivery, and that means I get to coach and support and help grow all the Agile professionals in the company. And I help them to help their teams grow and share the sort of knowledge in the wider organization. I've been working in and alongside software delivery teams for probably over 15 years now, um, so I'm just really passionate about if efficiency and helping teams to improve. But enough about me, let's, uh, let's go back to our um, blue and our red pill data. So I'm going to share where we were and where we are now and then start walking through that journey with you. So before we started this journey, we um, used to work on big programs, we would have lots of projects, we would have planning days and we would spend an awful lot of time on um, estimates of planning. And because of this, we were quite often chasing deadlines. Um, as I 
I hope we all know on this call, estimates are just a best guess with the information you have at the time. And because of that, we were often late as well. So being late meant that we would be trying to go faster without really knowing why we'd not hit those deadlines in the first place. We were solving symptoms and not problems. Where we are now, so if we fast forward nearly five years, um, we now take a more probabilistic approach to our deliveries. We use probabilistic forecasting and have regular conversations um, about the action we might want to take based on the current data. So we now mitigate risk before it has a chance to manifest itself and we're able to solve problems instead of symptoms. On top of the probabilistic forecasting, we are using flow data and Dora metrics to help us to continuously improve. So what I'm going to do today is run through these five points with examples of how this has played out for us. Um, I will <laughs> caveat this with, we are far from perfect. Um, you know, we're still on a journey too, but this is just about sharing where, where we've got to so far. And I'll start off by talking about probabilistic forecasting. Um, apologies if I say that fast, I've said it so much, I'm going to spit it out, probabilistic forecasting. So um, I'm going to talk about what I mean by this and how we've used it. If we think about um, forecasting in any guise, so this could be anything from weather to economics, but in our case, software delivery, all we're saying really is that we're using past and present data to make predictions about the future. So in order to get into probabilistic forecasting, I first want to talk about what is late anyway. So when we're delivering software, if you're late, it essentially means you've probably mismanaged expectations. For you to be late, someone was expecting something by a certain date, which means you've been planning for certainty in an uncertain world. Being late means that you've lost an opportunity to manage risk, so it represents choices that people never got to make. So it's, it's likely something unexpected happened along the way. Either you weren't able to manage that expectation or you didn't do anything about it. And that's probably because you're using the wrong data. It's not intentional. It's that you're not using the data that can help you with that. Lateness is also really damaging to culture. It grinds people down. So if you're regularly late, the urgency people think they get from deadlines goes away because the more often you're late, the less it means. And then finally, it's a driver for unsustainable behaviours. It's where you see things like corners being cut, technical debt um, sort of increasing and people doing overtime, all those terrible behaviours that we don't want. So whilst this slide is a little bit flippant, I could not resist the opportunity to quote Douglas Adams. I'm a big fan of Douglas Adams. Um, as I've mentioned already, we are a financial institution, which means we're heavily regulated. So dates actually really do matter to us. So we don't always have the luxury of just being able to deliver when we want to. We generally have a mix of work. So we have some regulatory work and then we have some product based work. And this approach works for both of those types of work. And I will, <laughs> will reiterate now as well. We aren't perfect and there's times we need to check ourselves with this approach and make sure we're not falling back into old ways of working. And with some stakeholders, this is easier than others. And I'll get onto stakeholders in a little bit. So if we just talk about the differences now. So plans and estimates often done at the beginning of a delivery when we know the least about what needs to be done. Um, they can also be redone throughout the sort of process at great time expense. They can use very certain language and a calculated best based on experience and opinions. Um, you might see you know, this type of certain language with maybe a random or calculated bit of uh, contingency thrown in. Whereas probabilistic forecasts are made up of a probability and a range. So they tend to look something a little bit like this. So when we say um, there is an 85% chance of completing 10 or more work items by a date, the percentage part of this statement is our probability. And this needs to be a business decision. It needs to be whatever's right for your business because you need to be really aware that when you say there's an 85% chance of something happening, you're also saying there's a 15% chance that that won't happen. <coughs> Excuse me. So we use 85% chance at principality. That doesn't mean it's right or wrong. That's just what works for us. When we talk about the range part of this statement, 
this is either the number of work items to be delivered um, or the time frame. So if you want to know a date, the number of work items to be delivered is your range. Um, and if you want to know how many work items are being delivered, your date will be the range. So it's really important when we talk about probabilistic forecasts to know we're not giving any definites here. However, a word of warning from experience, when you start sharing this, people will look for the certainty in these statements. And there is no certainty. This is a probabilistic way of approaching things rather than deterministic. And the really important thing is we need to do this continuously. So this isn't a one off at the start of a, of a feature or a, a, a batch of work items. This is something you can do really, really regularly. Um, so hopefully that all sounds good. And you're probably thinking, OK, so, so how, how do I do a probabilistic forecast? What do I need? <laughs> so all you need is the cycle time of 10 or more items that were done by the same team and the future work needs to look like the past and that's it so when i say cycle time um this is just whatever start and end point you choose um uh, we can get into the definition of cycle time but that's essentially what it means the start and end of your process um, when I um, say the same team, I mean, you can't use one team's data to forecast for another team. That's not how it works. And when I say future looks like the past, what I mean is we can't fundamentally change the shape of the work and expect to use the same data, or we can't change the text that completely and expect to use the same data. If that happens, because you only need 10 items to forecast, it's a really quick process before you're able to um, start forecasting. So the next thing you do once you have this data is you run a Monte Carlo simulation. So I use Actionable Agile to do this. You don't have to, that's just the tool I use. Actionable Agile accepts data in a simple spreadsheet like you can see here, or it can integrate with like Jira, Azure DevOps, Trello, a bunch of others, I believe. Um, I'm not really gonna go into the mechanics of Monte Carlo forecasting, and I will provide some resources, or resources at the end. Um, the Julia that Mark mixed me up with at the, uh, on the invite of this has done a talk um, on Mark's channel as well called What Are The Odds? I'd really recommend watching that because that will give some background into this too. Um, however, what you do need to know, I guess, about Monte Carlo simulation is it, it gets used in many industries, like from weather to economics, and we obviously use it for software delivery. What it does is you essentially ask it a question. So it's either when will I get this work or you know, how long will it take to deliver this? When you ask it that question, it looks at your data and it goes, okay, let's do a random sample over this. So if I say, how long will it take me to deliver 15 items? It'll randomly pick 15 items and give you an answer. And it does that 10,000 to a million times. So what you get then is a huge variety of um, data. So when we say there's an 85% chance of delivering something on or before a date, what we're saying is out of all of those um, thousands and thousands of random simulations, 85% of them came on or before a date. So <laughs> we could go down a wormhole here and talk for hours. I'm not going to go any more into the mechanics of that, but at a high level, that's essentially what it's doing behind the scenes. Um, also really open for if anyone wants to reach out to me by email or Twitter, if people are still using that. Um, yeah, happy to talk about it outside of this. So differences, probabilistic forecasting um, based on real data, so not opinions or guesses. There's no drain on the delivery team either. These probabilistic forecasts take seconds to generate and it's just done on the data that exists. So less context switching for the teams and more focus on delivering value. Um, this little calendar here as well that you can see on the right hand side is something that Actionable Agile um, puts out and I find this quite useful when talking to stakeholders because it helps get around that certainty and you're showing the ranges and the percentages so that's quite nice. Um, when we do create estimates there's so much we miss so we forget about the cost of context switching, we think about effort, not elapsed time sometimes. We're actually surprisingly optimistic. Um, we don't take into account things like disruptions or meetings. 
but using um, real data helps us get around all of this because it's baked into the data already. That stuff's already happening. That's the background noise and that's represented in your cycle times. <coughs> Excuse me, frog in my throat. Um, so if we think about Hofstadter's law, it tells us it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account Hofstadter's law. So that's why it's really unreliable for us to try and predict when we could use real data instead. So we accept with things like weather forecasts that they move daily based on what's going on at the time. And I think understanding that this is also the nature of software delivery is really key. So using forecasts doesn't mean you no longer have a date. It actually means you have more information now than you ever had before. And more importantly, like we talked about the blue pill, I mean, it was an illusion. You never had that date anyway. You just thought you did. So understanding that, I believe, is half the battle. So at the start, I mentioned we now take a probabilistic approach and we have continuous conversations. So I'm going to walk through a real example now of which will hopefully demonstrate that using this probabilistic approach is giving us um, the earliest possible opportunity to take action. So this is a real example with a team that we spun up um, just over 12 months ago now. Uh, we had a few features that needed to be delivered, wanted to try out some new ways of working, um, so, so they formed, and um, this is going to be their story. Apologies if you can hear that, my cat is in the background. <laughs> um, so the bottom line is going to represent time passing, so the further right we go, the further in the future we're going. And we're going to start by representing the amount of work left to do with a red line. So when this red line goes up, it means the amount of work left to do is increased, and when the red line goes down, it means the amount of work left to do is decreased. So here we are. So this is day one. The team started work. The line is trending down. So that means the number of items left to deliver is decreasing as you'd expect. I'm about to introduce a second line, which is going to be sort of tealy green. Um, this line is going to represent the forecasted range of dates for the number of items left. So if this green line goes up, it means our forecasted date range is moving out. And if this line goes down, it means our forecasted date range is coming in. So here you are. You'll notice that the line doesn't start at the same date as the red line. And this is because, as I said, this is a prototype team we spun up, test new ways of working. So we didn't have any data prior to this. So they, we needed to start delivering a little bit to get that data. The forecasted date range corresponds to the work items remaining at the time. So the, this highlighted date range is based on the work left to do at that date, but uses all the data collected up until that point. So remember this sort of greeny blue line, if it goes up, it means the date range is going out. If it comes down, it means it's coming in. So the key team keep working through. You can see the red lines going down. So we're churning through work nicely and the, the green line is remaining pretty stable so nothing unexpected happening here we've got a pretty stable um, date range and the number of items we've got left to do is decreasing so this is what happened next so as you can see the red line is starting to flatten out here and our green line is going up and this is what i mean when i say you get the earliest possible opportunity to take action. Because of this movement, we could have a conversation about what was happening and take action. So what actually was happening in this scenario was that someone had asked the team to help out with um, a production issue. Team are wonderfully helpful and they just jumped on and helped with this, which is, which is great. But we could see the impact this was having on this delivery, which was really important. And we could have a conversation to understand, um, was there anything we could do to help or support here? And it turned out there was another available team that could help with this. And we were able to move that work there. And this team were able to focus back on what they were doing. And when we did this, the red line started to come down again and the forecast stabilized. However, what we need to look at here is though that date range has now moved out. So it's now later than it was, but we know the exact reason for this. So we can communicate that, we can manage expectations, but it also gives us options. So we were able to have conversations about, okay, do we want to 
decrease the scope a little bit? Is there another sort of team that could help out? Is, is there anything else we can do? And they gave us those options and it let us speak to our stakeholders and manage those expectations. And it's really important as well to note that whilst that forecasted date range has moved backwards, it didn't move back as much as it would if we hadn't have known it was happening. And it saves a lot of frustration um, later on in the delivery. So we were able to manage those expectations. So that scenario shows that we can use probabilistic forecasting to solve problems when they come along, but it actually also gives us the opportunity to mitigate risk. So for this very same scenario, the next thing that happened was a, um, oh, well, whilst you're in there, we also need this done as well. Um, and when this came up, obviously backlog sizes increase, more work, um, and we were able to forecast the impact of that. And this is what it looked like. So yeah, really, really predictable, right? You have more scope, the date goes out. Um, however, what we were able to do was simulate this for stakeholders and understand the actual impact without estimating. Um, this took seconds to generate um, and we were able to have those conversations and you know, encourage releasing in smaller batches and also show, okay, well, if, if you do want to wait and have this extra work as well, this is, this is what it costs you. And it allows us to mitigate those at risk and have those conversations. So that scenario shows that we can use probabilistic forecasting to solve problems when they come along. Um, so yeah, there were two sort of um, scenarios here where we were able to do this. It wouldn't have been unheard of in our past for um, us to either just try and absorb the work and hit the same date or to spend a lot of time um, re-estimating and um, yeah, continually re-estimating and just wasting time and losing focus on what we were actually doing. Um, yeah, so I, I do need to talk about the people side of this as well. So when we first started doing this about sort of five years ago, um, I spent a lot of time explaining the new data um, and discussions were typically tailored to whatever audience I was talking to. Um, it's really important to note that the um, education, just like the forecasting, needs to be continuous. So what I found was when I would explain this to people, I'd say, you know, you get the earliest possible opportunity to take action. You get to see how, you know, events that are going on in real time are affecting our potential um, dates. And everyone sort of really loves that, gives them options, they can take action. However, as soon as that date starts moving around, people get really uncomfortable because it's not what they're used to. They feel like you've taken that certainty away from them. And just like I was saying a couple of slides ago, really demonstrating that they never had that date anyway. What we're giving them is more information. We're not taking certainty away from them. However, it's really natural, I think, once you're a little bit uncomfortable to default to what you know and default to how you've worked in the past. So um, yeah, it's, it's part of continuous education and also you know, showing people that we're not taking anything from you, we're giving you the ability to take action here. So I spend time walking through this with teams, um, heads of departments, even our COO and a couple of non-exec directors at the time. But yeah, it's not enough. You need to keep doing it and, and keep showing people that you never had this date anyway, you just thought you did. What we're showing you now is what's actually going on under the surface. So, shared the concepts of forecasting, explained to teams and stakeholders, but what we were also able to do is show that just by collecting cycle time, you're also collecting flow data. And that's really powerful for us to improve, become more efficient and progress. So, as we've, uh, as I've explained, you know, we're capturing the cycle time. If you imagine these green dots are user stories or work items, whatever you use, for any story that has a start date, but not an end date, we know exactly how old that is. And that's item H, and it's a really useful metric to keep an eye on, and I'll give you some examples in a couple of slides time. So if you're looking at the age of your non-closed work items on a daily basis, and you focus your attention on the oldest items first, that will really help you with predictability. Additionally, all the items that have a start date but not an end date gives you your work in progress. And um, by capturing an end date, we know our rate of delivery, so we know our throughput. 
So I'm going to go through a real example now from quite a long time ago when we first started doing this, um, and hopefully it'll bring some of this to life. So this is a team um, I was working with years ago when we first started introducing uh, this type of data. And what we've got here is a scatter plot. So each of these blue dots represented a user story for us. So along the bottom, um, for each dot represents the date at which that item was completed. And on the left axis, that shows us the cycle time. So how, how long it took to do. So we took this data into a retrospective. We talked about it as a team. We can see, you know, it's not great. We have cycle times longer than our sprint length. Um, based on the data we were capturing, I propose we tried using um, whip limits as an experiment, so limiting the amount we have in progress at any given time. And they agreed to run this as an experiment, so we did that for a few sprints. We did it for a little while, and the team, it, it felt different to them. So they felt like, you know, they, they'd broken the habit of starting multiple work items and context switching, and it felt a little bit unusual, a bit less pressured. It didn't, it didn't feel like they were as busy, but then when we looked at the data, it showed us that um, you know our cycle times are dramatically um, reduced and our throughput had also increased. And this is an example of where we've used this flow data in a really actionable way. What this chart also gives us is the ability to do what's known as single item forecasting and set a service level expectation for the team. So this is exactly the same data, exactly the same chart I just shown you. However, if you'll notice on the right hand side, we've now introduced percentile lines. So if we take this one, for example, um, this 85 percent tells us that 85 percent of the items that were completed in this time frame were done underneath this line, which means we can communicate a single item forecast based on our past data. So we can say that there's an 85 percent chance of delivering a single user story in 21 days or less. So when we were working in the office, because this was 2018, uh, but pre-COVID, um, we used to have this on our physical board and everyone knew what our SLE was. And just going back to what I was talking about earlier around item age, we were looking at this on a daily basis. So we knew how old all our items were. So we could see that when our item age was creeping towards our SLE, we knew we should be taking additional action and making sure that we're dealing with those because those are the scenarios that will sort of impact our predictability and um, increase our cycle times. So, yeah, that's why item age is really important. And this is that's how you can use it. But it's really important when we're doing these single item forecasts that we think about the data in which we're doing it over. So, again, this tiny little graph is what I've just shown you. If we look at that data before we did our whip limit experiment, our SLE was an 85% chance of delivering in 25 days or less. However, if we look at it after, you can see that was now seven days or less. So once we were certain this was um, a consistent way of um, delivering and this wasn't just a fluke, the WIP limit had had this impact and this is now how we delivered, we could then use this data going forward for our SLEs and also for our um, multiple icon forecasts for our probabilistic forecasting. So really useful for the team, um, really also useful for communicating to stakeholders that we're improving. One of the other bonuses of these scatter plots is you're also able to show how the previous estimation models probably weren't giving people what they thought they were. They were more like the blue pill type data, and I'll go through that now. So again, exactly the same data I've just shown you, except now it's color coded by the story point value that each of these items were given. So um, if we take the blue dot, for example, this ranges from like one to 60 days. It's probably the most extreme case on here, but even after the whip limit varied between like one and 10 days. So this isn't a team that were poor estimating by any stretch. And in my experience, this is how this looks time and time again across many teams with many different levels of maturity. It's also the case whether you estimate in hours, days or points. So I appreciate points aren't supposed to translate to hours, yet we do tend to use them to plan. So. <laughs> 
people use it that way, even if they don't realize uh, it. This is an exercise I'd actually encourage most people to do with their teams, because I think it really sort of um, show how there isn't the correlation between estimates and delivery that we might think. Um, and what I say, oh, uh, I will say, I'm not here to hate on story points. We we still have teams that use story points, and I can see that they can be really useful, and they can start generate, they can generate conversations. But in my opinion, that it shouldn't be used for planning and setting expectations. I also appreciate it's a hard habit to break sometimes for teams that have really got into using these. But for, for me, they can be a little bit wasteful and they can mismanage expectations. And then finally, for the flow data, we've got our throughput information. Oh, sorry, my cat. <laughs> so we've got what we've got here is a chart that's representing, I think this was for, for a couple of teams, not just one. Um, how much we were delivering on a daily basis. So the green line is the trend line, and you can see this was right at the start when we started using this data. So it's it's going in a positive direction. Really great to see the progress we're making, but also communicate out to stakeholders. Um, one thing to note here is our green line doesn't always go up. <laughs> and the same with the forecasting over time. It's an opportunity to ask questions and to look at our data, look at how we're working, see if there's any experiments that aren't playing out the way we think they are. Um, yeah, and just a real tool to be taking action. Um, yeah, so what we've learned, I've run through, um, we've used probabilistic forecasting, flow metrics, continuous conversations to mitigate risk, but also to solve problems. And taking that meaningful action before it's too late. The benefits of this has been, you know, we have that early opportunity to take action. We take our stakeholders on the journey with us and it's not too late. Um, you know, we've also learned there's a lot of education that needs to be done alongside this and we can't expect people just to accept it straight away. Sometimes letting the data prove itself is really useful too. So, We've learned that it also takes time. So my journey um, with this started by going to a conference, uh, Agile Cymru, about five years ago, and I saw a talk, talk by Dan Vacanti, and my mind was blown. <laughs> I knew this was something we needed to do. Um, what we were currently doing wasn't working, and this looked like it could help. So I booked on his course, um, along with Jose Casal, and um loved that and then brought all those sort of learnings back to principality buzzing with ideas of how it could help us so as i said that was about five years ago so we started this off with just like one or two teams built enough data to start sharing and then it spread to the entire program at the time now we're on value streams all the value streams are using this um what we also found is that just getting started helps with the adoption so when I started doing this, another program was interested. They could see what we were doing and Scrum Master asked me to come along, show them how to forecast, help them run one, share a bit about how it works. So we did this. Um, they were working on a regulatory piece of work with a really sort of hard date and um, big scope, all that sort of um, stuff. And we ran a forecast. The forecast um, was came in at 85% likely on or before a date that was about six months later than the team had estimated. So the team were like, oh, we'll get this done in a month. And it was actually six months later the forecast came out. Um, obviously sharing this with the team, project managers, stakeholders, the team rejected it low, like, no, nope, we can get this done in a month. Project managers obviously gonna <laughs> pick the shorter of the two dates as other stakeholders. So they went back to their traditional ways of working. And um, they were late. In fact, they weren't that far off the forecasted date. Um, they kept estimating, they kept going back to their ways of working. And on that occasion, they chose to take the blue pill. They chose to believe the illusion of the uh, estimated date. The teams who were involved with that now do use forecasting. So I guess just to reiterate, if you're interested in this, it does take time and just getting started can help people adopt it, even if they don't do it straight away. It's just get, giving the data the sort of chance to prove itself. So I talked a bit about how we've got here. Um, you know, we're well and truly down the rabbit hole. We now take a more 
data-driven approach to delivery. Um, we realise that whilst we're better now than we ever have been before, in certain areas we have some non-optimal um, delivery methods, particularly in what we've branded as our path to life, and that just represents the ways of working, the technical path, the culture, the process involved in getting work into the hands of our customers. So we want to keep using data in a way that is meaningful, and our aspirations align um, really closely to the DORA research program investigations. So we still want to use a data-driven approach, and we want to use this to improve capabilities and practices for the benefit of our organization, but ultimately our customers. So we found, yeah, we, we align really closely to what DORA had to offer. So for anyone who doesn't know, DORA represents um, eight years of research and data from over like 33,000 professionals worldwide. It provides an independent view into the practices and capabilities that drive high performance in technology and in culture too. And for us, it gives us sort of guidance and metrics and we can use this to monitor our current state and the, the performance over time. So if anyone hasn't looked at this, I'd really recommend going on the website and there's like a little quick check tool that you can do for your company and see how you're comparing to the rest of industry. So, once we knew that's sort of something that could help us, we needed to sort of agree an approach across the value streams. So, we wanted to set a direction and um, define the data. So, with all the teams, we set a sort of general direction that we wanted all our value streams to safely de deliver value whenever they want to, reducing the friction and increasing the efficiency. And obviously we wanted to use the DORA metrics to do that. So DORA defines lead time as code commit to um, deployed in production. That's just the DORA definition of um, lead time. So for us, um, we've got a slight variation on that based on some technical constraints we have at the time. So we've got lots of new tech, but we've got some real legacy tech in the mix as well, which makes some of this information a little bit more tricky for us to capture right now, something we're working on for the future. So we're looking at from when we start the work to when we deploy in um, production, and that's lead time. So by knowing our lead time, we also know the second uh, metric, which is our delivery frequency. So we know how often we're um, delivering to customers. And we also capture two more metrics, which are change failure rate, so how often a change causes a failure, um, as well as mean time to recovery, which is every time a customer experiences an outage, how quickly we're able to recover that. So we also use actionable agile um, and the scatter plots for lead time in the same way as um, I've explained previously, and that gives us really good information. It, lets you see patterns such as batching, time between deliveries, and you're also able to look at your SLE at that level as well. So just basically more data we can take action with. It's really important um, that there's a healthy tension between these numbers too. So we can't look at just one on their own. We don't wanna reduce lead time, but as a result, increase our change failure rate. So it's important we're having continuous conversations and looking at these um, collectively, not individually. And yeah, so we set that direction, we defined what data we were going to start to um, use to monitor this. And then we needed to understand a little bit more about the current state of our system. So all the teams spent some time value stream mapping and um, understanding what our path to life looked like, understanding our waste, our dependency, any wait times, and then started to look at and come up with ideas for opportunities to improve. We were really keen to ensure that we were focusing on our, all our efforts on what would have the biggest impact for our customers on the DORA metrics. So like, if you were to take these funnels as an example of our system, you would only ever get an output of like one widget a day because you've got a bottleneck at C. So we could spend plenty of time automating, adjusting our ways of working at like A, B and D, but actually our customers aren't gonna see any difference. Our DORA metrics aren't gonna change. So all the teams looked at this um, mapping exercise we did, we identified our bottlenecks and then came up with opportunities to solve this and hypothesized how this would, this would um, impact our DORA metrics. 
because we did that, we were also able to prioritize those opportunities and go for the sort of ones that are going to make the biggest difference first. Where we are now is we're in this sort of implementing a measure phase, like almost like our um, first cycle, where we're putting things into practice, we're measuring, and then we're understanding the impact that that has on the um, original mapping we did and understanding our current state again and thinking about are the opportunities still the same or have they changed? Has our bottleneck moved? What's the next thing for us to tackle? And we intend to keep going around in this circle and using the Dora metrics as indicators for has things worked as we hypothesized or did something not go right and we need to learn from that and try it a little bit differently. And that's where we are now with um, that and our Dora metrics. <laughs> Excuse me. So I've walked through um, the five points describing where we have come from and where we are now. We are still on our journey and I know we're not um, perfect, but what we do now is we use probabilistic forecasting because we know software delivery isn't certain, so we need to stop treating it like it is. We have continuous conversations. Um, so we're managing expectations. We're not falling victim to the illusion of the estimated day. And we're also avoiding the negative consequences of um, being late. We mitigate risk because we're not waiting to be late to take the action. And we're also solving problems instead of the symptoms. So yeah, we use a probabilistic forecasting alongside the flow metrics and now the DORA data to drive that meaningful action and to try and take um, corrective action rather than waiting until it's too late. So thank you for staying with me for 40 minutes. Um, hopefully I've shown you that the future is uncertain um, and for the benefit of our stakeholders and our customers, we need to make sure that we're using data that's um, driving meaningful conversations and meaningful action because you know that's better for everyone. And remember, it's better to be approximately right rather than exactly wrong. Remember, you never had that day anyway. So um, I mentioned I'd share some resources. <laughs> this is about as many as I could squeeze on one slide. These are my favorites. So. If you're interested in getting into this and starting to use Actionable Agile, I'd recommend the two books on the ends by Dan Vacanti. Um, as I mentioned before, Julia Wester's done a talk, which I believe is on March, March Channel called What Are the Odds? The talk that got me into all this and got me really excited about it and realizing that this was a sort of way to go is that top one there by Dan Vacanti, your project behaves like a hurricane forecast, like one. I'd really recommend you watching that if you've not seen that already. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. I think we've got plenty of time for questions, Mark. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, let's see. Tim had a question. He dropped off. I'd like to hear what you said. He said he was having trouble um, getting good start and stop times from his team. Have you run into that? Any suggestions for that type of issue? Um, start and stop time. So what we do um, is we use. Uh, we, we actually use Azure DevOps and we have sort of work items in there and we literally take the active to close time. But what I have done in the past as well, when I've wanted to capture flow metric at a more granular level, like sort of the different um, sort of columns and not want to sort of increase uh, states in the system is just even a manual time timestamp just to get enough data to prove it works and to get buy-in before you think of something a little bit more automated. So. I wouldn't be afraid of doing it a little bit manual to get started even as like you only have to be accurate to a day as well. We're not talking about minutes and hours, a day is enough. So yeah, I wouldn't be afraid to do it a little bit manual to start with if it is, is causing the um, difficulties. So a couple other questions. Let's see, Gil had some questions. Uh, what sort of adjustments need to be made in the project tracking tool such as JIRA to support this method of forecasting? So we didn't do anything. You just need, um, so yeah, I'm, I've used Jira a little bit. I'm not that familiar though. I use uh, your DevOps more, but we just have a date stamp for when we set something to active and also when we're closed. So it almost doesn't matter what happens in the middle. As long as you've got that start date and that end date and you can pull that out pretty easily, then you've got what you need. For the tool I use, it actually integrates with Jira. Um, so you don't even have to worry about all that. You just need to tell it what to look for and it does it for you. And I, I've had, use stuff like that or gotten these statistics out of Jira and it wasn't 
it wasn't very hard as long as we could agree when something gets pulled into this column, this is when we're starting to work on it. When it gets put in this column, it means we, we've gone to production with it. As long as you got those two points, Jira usually makes it pretty easy to get, get the information yeah. out of. Yeah, and with um, the integration of Actionable Agile as well, you almost don't even need to get it out. It's, um, right. It integrates really well, so which makes it even easier. Yes. But yeah, you're right. It's all about the discipline as well. So making sure that you're you're using, you know, just your hygiene of using those um, work items or user stories in right. Jira. Uh, other question, what are the cons or gotchas of this forecasting mm -hmm. approach as opposed to other message methods such as story points? And you kind of had a graph that highlighted that, I thought, but what, what other thoughts do you have? Yeah, sorry, my cat keeps trying to jump up. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah, the the gotchas are people will still look for certainty, and it takes a lot, a lot of um, a lot of sort of education and re-education. And some stakeholders will get it quicker than others. The other thing, yeah, when it's not going in the way people want, they'll default to okay, well, let's just get a plan then. And it's like, well, <laughs> you can have a plan, but then you don't know what's going on. You can, you can have both if you want. So yeah, I, I think that's the biggest thing is that is the, like when, when you start talking about this, people are like, oh yeah, it sounds great. But when you start using it, that's when you've really got to stick to your guns and show them what it's given them. And what you just described, I find fascinating because it's almost like, you know, we're trying to drive to Chicago or something like that. And I'm looking at the fact that I'm only going 35 miles per hour on average. And yeah. you start showing that to people and stuff like, yeah, let's not look at that. Let's uh, let's just have a plan of when we're going to get there. Like, well, now, actually, this tells you the truth about when you're going to get there. But it's easy. Yeah. If you're not used to it. It is very, very uncomfortable. Um, yeah, what's the, that's a really what, good analogy. I like that. Um, it's, yeah, what you're doing right now, not what you predicted a week ago. <laughs> right, right. It, it's it's snowing or you've lost two of your tires or whatever it happens to you. You've got kids that have stopped go to the bathroom every 15 minutes, you know, all those things. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, what is the biggest challenge to companies consider to consider when to adopt it? Ah, I can't talk. What is the biggest challenge to companies to consider when adopting this forecasting approach? Hmm. That's a, I guess that's an interesting um, question. It's almost something that you could do in parallel if you're unsure about. It's so um, time, like it, it, it's so quick to do. It's almost like you, you, that's how we did it to start with is I was doing it with a couple of teams until I had enough data to really show the case of, of this because I, I just can't, I can't see why you would pick a planning approach over like this if I'm honest. <laughs> right. But um, yeah, that, that that stakeholder communication is is probably the toughest thing. Okay, well, a couple a couple notes I had that I thought were pretty interesting um, kind of stuck out to me is you're saying you guys are using the eighty fifth, you know, eighty five percent will be done by this, but yeah. there's nothing that if if people aren't comfortable with that or just don't like it, you can give you can give different numbers, right? You could call seventy fifth, mm -hmm. or if they if it's really really important, you could say we need to be at ninety five percent chance that this is this is going to work. Yeah. Um, which, it's whatever suits you, I guess. Right. Well, well, what I what I like about that is it kind of forces management to know what the numbers mean and what they want. Yeah. How willing are they to to? I mean, they should be willing with some level of risk, um, mm -hmm. but it kind of makes them have to have to think through that. Um, yeah. I also thought it was really helpful. Let's see. Oh, oh, that you were able to notice the, looking at your stats, you were able to figure out that the team was doing stuff. Um, that was slowing them down. Is that a regular thing you run into? Like you see the numbers aren't doing much and you have to go back in and say, hey, everybody's everybody's sick or, or whatever it could be. Yeah, yeah. And um, th this is where it's, it's great because actually whilst it makes people uncomfortable when the forecast either goes static or goes goes the wrong way, goes the way they, they, they don't desire, actually what it's doing is telling you something. It, it's the data isn't doing anything for you apart from giving you a signal to here you should probably check something out um so yeah it, it happens quite regularly and you know I, i'm living through a real example right now with the team where um they've had a little bit of a, a change of, of of people um you know like contracts being renewed, not being renewed and stuff like that and obviously it has an impact and it lets you have those conversations so yeah it's really powerful it, it plays out a lot is there, um, you, you mentioned a thing where people were, um, they felt like they were going slower, but they were actually getting more stuff done. How common yeah. is that? I mean, do you run into that a lot? Because that that's very, that's very intriguing. The idea that the way people felt was not 
aligned with what they were actually doing. Yeah, so that was about five years ago, to be fair. And I think it was our first time playing around with some of these things. And, you know, p people like to be busy. No one likes to be bored. But it was about a sort of channeling that sort of, okay, so you're not picking something newer. But it encourages some of the really good behaviours, like, you know, the sort of pair and mob programming and helping other people solve problems. And that's something I think we dealt with a long time ago. So it's not so surprising now, but... Um, yeah, definitely at the start, people were a little bit like, oh, well, I, I, I finished my bit, I'll go and pick something else up. And it really helps with that sense of team, I think. Cool. Uh, any other questions for, for Julie? This has been very interesting. I've been enjoying I really liked seeing the, the real stats of things that were, were happening. So that's really cool. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Cool. Okay, well, to let people know what's uh, what's coming up uh, next week, we're going to be talking about secrets of successful Scrum Masters. So that should be a lot of fun. And then the week after that, uh, I think we're doing, oh, Agile at a Distance, Effective Remote and Hybrid Teams. And I believe that's the talk that has all my stories of ways I've embarrassed myself in remote settings. So that will be a lot of fun, if nothing else, to come and just laugh at all the mistakes I've made. Um, and then on the 28th, uh, Retrospectives at Work, Phil Ledgerwood from Kansas City is going to be talking to us about that. So excited about these things coming up. If for some reason you're not getting the uh, the invites or they're going to spam or something like that, please reply to me. Let me know so I can try to figure out what's going on. Um, every once in a while, something, some system doesn't like something that our system is doing. I've got to tweak it to, to make it make it happy. So do let me know if you see anything like that. But thank you so much, Julie. Um, appreciate the uh, appreciate the time you spent on this. This was great. I really enjoyed it and learned quite a few things and love seeing that actual data of like, here's what we were doing and here's what it showed and here's what we found out when we dug into it. So thank you so much for your time and thank you everybody for coming and hope to see you next week. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's great having you here.